Well, good morning. We are at the uh, Farm Progress Show down here in Decatur, Illinois. It's the uh, last day and uh, been fabulous weather. And uh, this morning we are honored to have Cole with us. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about corn heads and maybe a little bit about residue management and maybe a little bit about stratification. So uh, all anyway, the fun stuff. Uh, yes. So Cole, tell us uh, whereabouts are you from and what your crops look like? So I'm from central Iowa, basically smack in the middle of Iowa. Okay. And we are in a, a good yield potential zone, but we're starting to get some southern rust rolling in. And most of our soybean fields are lodged. So oh dear. we'll see what things look like for harvestability. So right now it's kind of a race between can we reach black lair or will our southern rust come us first? And then on the soybean side, can we just keep things off the ground? For sure, for sure. We're, uh, we're seeing the southern rust as well, and especially like the continuous corn. I, I'm afraid, I've got one field, and I'm afraid when I get home, it's gonna be all brown. And harvest is gonna be early, but the ears I think are still gonna be wet. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I'm with you. I, I think we wanna try to get it harvested before it's all on the ground this year. Yeah, it'll be a challenge, but I mean, that's farming. If it was easy, everybody would do it, right? That, that's for sure. Been here before and we'll know how to get the crop in the bin. <laughs> so this year, uh, we're, we're honored that uh, you're gonna be running uh, one of our corn heads this year. Yes. Is it a eight row, 12 row corn head, 12 row yep. 30? Yep, we're gonna be running a 12 row 30. We've been running into issues on our farm where we come in with our standard corn head, we're having these huge chunks of residue coming out the bottom of the head, and then we've been trying to do some tillage to address some stratification problems on our farm where we have the fertilizer just in the top one or two inches and we're wanting to get that deeper and when we come in we're pulling up these huge balls of all the trash because it's just not coming through and then you come back two years later you still see these chunks of residue sitting there and we know we have a lot of nutrients tied up inside of those yep. and that from my understanding is our most available nutrients is what's actually in there so we want access to that and you guys have a solution for our problem. Well, they always say that necessity is the mother of invention. And I kind of went through that in the late 90s when we just started to see the BT genetics coming on. And then I was also in 15 inch corn. And uh, I, I was growing corn stalk residue faster than I could get it to decompose and struggling to get it planted. And so that's where we started to do the innovation and come out. So we have the uh, the 10 blade BT chopper uh, that we're gonna put on your corn head for you. And um, we're 100% uh, confident that it's it's gonna take care of your corn stalk uh, residue problems. Now, do you do uh, a lot of tillage on the stalks or do you no-till right into those after harvest? So we've been kind of doing a mixture of things the last six or seven years. When my grandpa was alive, mm -hmm. we double disked everything and then came through and field cultivated and we planted into that. So right. residue at that time, you just pretty much pounded it away. And after my grandpa passed away, we started going towards more of a no-till approach. Yep. And so we were planting just straight into things. I mean, we saw some areas where we were fighting the residue. Yep. But then we started getting into soil sampling and then learning about nutrient stratification. And so now we're at a mix between how can we no-till or minimum till, but yet get rid of this stratification at the same time? All roads seem to be pointing us to strip till, but I haven't been able to get the rest of the operation on board with going that route yet. Yep. So we're trying to take baby steps towards it, but we're trying to do something in the meantime. Right, it, it's, a, it's a balancing act uh, for us as farmers. I mean, we love and adore the, the soil, the clean water, I don't think, you know, it's our office that we work in every day, and I don't think there's anybody on the planet that's more conscious about the environment. So, uh, yeah, we, we have to be able to grow food and um, get our fertilizer down in the soil. I've, you know, been no-tilling for 40 years, and I saw the same thing, a serious buildup of nutrients on the surface, and I was worried about them when you just leave them lay up on top that, you know, they're gonna wash. And, so yeah, we went the strip till route and uh, it seemed to have uh, helped helped a bunch. A few years ago, you made some YouTube videos talking about your, your stratification. Yes. And that was actually what opened my eyes to it, was stuff that you made. Yeah. 
And then, so I mean, it kind of went full circle with, uh, hey, like, we're having trouble with these stocks and this nutrient <laughs> stratification. And then here yeah. you come in with something you did 30 years ago or started 30 years ago. Right, right. Yeah, I can remember that it just wasn't getting the, the yield advantage that I was looking for. And I, I noticed even though the, the total soil test showed that I was fine, um, the corn plant was telling me it was not fine. So. And, You've been addressing this stratification. Mm -hmm. What have you been doing to do that? What, what did you start with? And then what did you learn from that starting process? And then what has that evolved into now? So we started out uh, looking at the top four inches and the bottom four inches. And that clearly showed there was a lot more nutrients on top. And then we went down, eventually we went inch by inch by inch all, all the way down. And 75, 80% of the nutrients were just right on the surface. And so the corn roots are actually sucking the fuel or the fertilizer out of a depleted zone. And so you, you kind of got to break that up, mix it up. And so um, we're doing um, about 100 acres a year uh, where we go in and stir the soil back up, get those nutrients mixed in there. What are you stirring that in with? Uh, we're using a chisel plow. And that way we still have a lot of residue left on top in the corn stalks. Um, and then we only do that you know, once mm -hmm. just to remove the problems that, that we have. And um, so then once we get the problem resolved, of course, then we move on to uh, either running strip till if we're gonna follow um, the, the next year. And uh, we're really looking to move to 20 inch strip till so we can combine the narrow row corn and the strip till in, in one clean sweep. And then we, we still like the narrow row beans because of the weed control. You're a lot better in the sprayer than I am. Going down a 20 inch row, I feel like I'd just be <laughs> mowing down half of it. Now we're also looking at uh, some of the other uh, newer pieces of equipment that are coming out that are kind of like a, a hoe drill uh, where you can actually load it with fertilizer and uh, inject it in the ground in like 10 inch centers. Really? Put the P and K down. Instead of trying to strip every 30 inches, it's a mini strip every 10 inches and put it down about two to four inches. And so that, that way we've got a more even distribution of the, the P and K. And then, like you said, we don't have to track it uh, quite so close. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we're still learning, I think, just like you are. Um, but uh, you don't know what you don't know. And once we identified, and there's nothing wrong with strip till. It was my management of, of not getting the nutrients into the, the root zone is, is what led to this problem. Do you think most people have this problem they just don't know? <laughs> yes. I, uh, by, by looking at people's fields and, I, you, know, you, you know, you're broadcasting the fertilizer over the top. And uh, phosphorus moves like one to two. Potassium maybe moves two to four. I think they're pre being pretty generous on, on assuming that the fertilizer moves once it's uh, surface applied. And, but in a no-till environment, you know, we have a little more moisture on the surface. We have more root growth on the surface to kind of counter that. But still, on a dry year, uh, those roots are going to go down and they're going to look for the moisture. And if it's six inches deep, they can find water down there, but there's no nutrients down there after 40 years of putting it all on the surface. I, I've mined out all the goody out, out of that six inch to eight inch zone, and you go below eight inches, nothing. and there's nothing down there. It's just wa moisture is about the only thing you'll find down there. So from an agronomic perspective, because yep. obviously when we're making these decisions, a, a pretty looking field is nice, but dollars in your bank account is really what you're for looking sure. for at the end for of the sure. day. Yep. That's, that's what keeps the doors open on the farm. What kind of agronomic response are you seeing based off what you've already done? So the, uh, in the test plots that we did four or five years ago, uh, by mixing uh, that high nutrient zone from the top and mixing it in with the depleted zone down below, uh, we picked up 9.8 bushels of soybeans, same fertilizer rate, um, just having it mixed into the soil. And then when we followed with corn, we had a 20 bushel yield advantage. So essentially you're seeing a hundred dollars an acre. Right. And then that, just that, from flipping that down. Right. We've got all the same inputs. All we did was just put the nutrients where they belong. 
which is in the root zone, and we're getting $100 an acre yield advantage. But we only have to do that just every once in a while. We don't have to so, do it all the time. You did that, you saw that yield response on year one, I take yes. it? Yes, yes. Have you since done a split on year two, three, four? We went out to year two and then that's kind of where, you know, we saw enough advantage that we kind of knew what we needed to do. Um, so you bring up a good question. How long does it take to get in trouble? <laughs> Uh, you know, as far as stratification is concerned. Mm -hmm. Does it take five years or like for me, it, it really became obvious after 40 years. Uh, you could just see it in the corn plant mm -hmm. and in the soybean plant. Um, so how long does it take to get in trouble? And then how fast can we get out of that? And then what do we do to avoid having it uh, in, in the future? So uh, that's one of the newer things in, in agriculture. Uh, the fungicides, um, have you got any test plots out this year at all, or did you spray any of your crops with fungicides? So we started doing 50-50s on our mm -hmm. fields about five years ago, and we just saw the split, and on our operation, we were seeing at least give us our money back. So okay. for us, we looked at it as more of an insurance policy. So if we had an insurance policy that was gonna give us our money back, we weren't really out anything other than the time to do it. but. Right. When we had a problem, that insurance policy paid off really well. So like on a year like this, where we have the southern rust coming in, yep. we got in at a good time with our fungicides, and it seems like it's doing a pretty good job of fighting it off on the important parts of the plant. Right. We're starting to get close to black layer on our earlier maturities. Right. I'm probably six days away on my earliest maturity corn. Right. And I'm just now starting to see where my bottom two, three leaves are starting to die. Yeah but the top half looks like we're still generating some sugars out of those leaves. Yeah, I'm interested to see it at home once we get the end rows off uh, to be able to go in and look at our plots. And you know, the first thing we're gonna look for is green versus brown. Uh, but we, we uh, with the drone, we, we would uh, spray 30 feet and then skip 60 uh, to make sure that we didn't have any border effects. Mm -hmm. And then we'd spray 30 and skip 60. And we just went all the way across the field like that. I do have my high management plot, my the 4% of my farm that I run right. tests on, where I'm not really looking at economic sense. I just want to see what is driving yield and what is not. Correct. And when I went into that, I have 120 acres. It's all the same hybrid. I went into an area that was outside of that. I saw some pretty severe southern rust and leaves dying. I actually saw some ears dropping in a few areas on the end rows. Yep. I went into my plot, it was green from the top to bottom. And I put extra foliar fertilizers on that. Yep. I did some different things with the nitrogen that we wide dropped on. And then I got two rounds of fungicide with it as well. Oh good. So we came in and had a V10 application with fungicide and then just after VT, when we were starting to see our first brown silks. Yep. And the ears are also significantly different. So I'm really excited to see that this year. Good. We've had really dry years the past two or three years. And so this is kind of the first time where more disease pressure, you're actually starting to see the fungicides oh, for sure. have that head and shoulder difference. Well, we'll look forward to uh, your results and, and your opinion of, of spraying fungicides, and I'll share with you uh, what we learned there as well. But uh, agriculture keeps changing every day. We fight new battles and continue to learn how to stay away from older problems. But uh, I guess we... I have one more question sure. for you. So if you were coming in, Let's say you're a new farmer, mm -hmm. or you've been farming your whole life, but it's always been your uncle, your dad, your grandpa making the decisions. But they just turned the books over to you. Okay, Marion, you are fully in charge now. The farm is up to you. <laughs> and you're looking at your operation and you're like, wow. Okay, we have problems with our soil. We have an older equipment line. Where do you start? The, uh, the, the thing that I would start with is, is uh, management decisions that are going to give me at least a 30% return on investment. I, I think to, to calculate for a 10 or 15, that's too tight. Um, I've learned over, over my years of farming that we as humans overestimate income and we underestimate expenses. So if we project a 30 or a 35% return on investment, I, I still hope to bring home a 10 or, or 15. 
Um, the things that I see have seen over all my years of, of research and being in the ag sector. Um, I can tell you that narrow row corn, narrow row soybeans, whether you get 20s, maybe you don't have to go all the way to 15s, but stops uh, a lot of erosion with those uh, solid seeded concepts. Uh, we can help shut down on weeds and then in stressful growing seasons we're going to get a yield advantage um, in, in both narrow row soybeans and, and narrow row corn. Uh, the other thing that I've learned is populations. On soybeans, I, you know, 75,000 at planting time is plenty, but you can also use um, the higher population for weed control. Um, so you put, you know, like drilled beans at 75,000 and they're going to they're be pretty sweet. And it also reduces the risk of white mold and, and things like that. Now on corn, it's, it's interesting. I think population runs along with the price or the selling price of, of corn. If corn's five or six bucks, you know, I'm, I'm going to shoot the moon at 36, 38,000. <laughs> but if corn's three to four dollars, you know, then we're going to be in the low 30s because you've, you've got to have a return on investment. Every time you buy another thousand plants or two thousand plants, that costs mm -hmm. money. And um, you don't really think about that. either. You don't really think about that. You just kind of think, oh, I'm going to do the same thing every year. But, yeah. But you go from 33,000 to 36. That's 10 percent more seed cost. Yep. That that is. And it, it's expensive. So we kind of watch that and, and higher populations lead to more potential problems for you know, lodging and, and so on and so forth. So those uh, two things right there are, are pretty important. Nitrogen is a very powerful input um, in a corn soybean rotation. Uh, corn on corn can, can certainly give you some issues. I don't know, do you guys have much corn on corn? At your we place? used to do a lot of corn on corn when I was growing up, but six years ago we switched to just a 50-50. It made our decision-making process a lot easier. Yeah, it, it certainly does. But. Uh, the, there's still a yield penalty associated. Uh, I know that our BT choppers, University of Illinois, says there's a 9.8 bushel yield advantage in uh, continuous corn. So we have a lot of people coming in here retrofitting heads just for that, uh, that reason. So uh, those are some of the big things. You don't have to spend a lot of money to get uh, a return on those things. So, so you are saying that if we narrow rows up, you're, you put that in the 30 to 35% return on investment category. Yep, yep. Controlling our populations, making sure we're in the right population zone. Yep. And then if we're in a corn on corn situation, something like the BT, the calmer BT chopper is gonna also be in that 30 to 35% return on investment category. Yep, for sure. And those are the things that kind of uh, keep, keep you going. The other thing I've learned over you know all my years of farming is that uh, when everybody else is running, you walk, and when everybody else walks, you run. So you just and, go do the opposite of what everybody does. Yeah, you kind of do. So right now, I mean, I think price of farm grounds come down some, uh, but you, 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 you can't get real crazy. I mean, I love new machinery as much as anybody does, but I really sit there and wonder, you know, if I've got a newer tractor to pull the planter, did it increase my yield? Well. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's there's certain limitations on on uh, equipment there as as well. But uh, it's uh, it's great to be in agriculture. I've I've you know got a wonderful career and looking forward to many more years. And we certainly have enjoyed having you join us today. And uh, oh, so what what combine are you going to put your corn head on? Our combine's going to be going on a Case H ninety two thirty. So we have okay. a twenty fourteen model. So we, ours has tracks as well. Okay. So it looks pretty cool driving out through the field. All right, that'll be sweet. Well, we look forward to visiting with you. If you have any issues at all this fall, why give us a holler. Yeah, I'm not worried about that. You guys have always been so good to work with for me. Anytime I have any problems. We actually ran Calmer BT choppers about eight years ago okay. when we had our eight row head. Okay. But then when we switched out to our 12, we got a folding head and it had a different design underneath and you guys sure. didn't offer a product for that particular head. Right. And so, we ended up going away from it just because we upgraded heads, but we really liked what we saw back then. Yeah, there's been several guys stopped in the booth, said, to, you know, we had them and we bought a new head that didn't have them and we're back in here because we, we really want to go back to them. Well, I know when we got into that other head, we started looking at what we had on the ground and it was pretty disappointing. Yeah, well, you'll be excited, especially come next spring. So, yes. all righty, Cole.
Thanks for joining us today. Yes, no, and thank you. And from the Farm Progress Show here in Decatur, we hope that you all have a safe harvest and a great day.